Hello, this is Dr. Dan Guerra again from Vera Med Studios in the Pacific Northwest. Today, we're going to drill into a topic that is necessary for us to get into uh, individual research studies involving a very important lipid class. That lipid class is something that probably many people are totally unaware of unless they're in a very specific, specific field of biochemistry uh, or perhaps in biomedicine. And that lipid class are the sphingolipids. I know really a dramatic name and probably something that you, you know, never have heard of. So it, for those of you that have heard of sphingolipids and of course are aware of them, uh, hopefully this will help um, organize some thoughts around it before we dig deep into the literature. And for the majority of you that don't know anything about it, hopefully this will serve as a primer for it. At any rate, I'd like to get started um, immediately so that we can get this discussion underway. Okay, um, again, I'm Dr. Dan Guerra, and I am the Chief Science Officer and Co-Founder of a company called Vera Med, which is our logo is right there. And this is our website, and that is the official email address that you can contact us uh, for consultation in any of your questions in biomedicine or just in uh, physical sciences, particularly biochemistry, uh, microbiology, molecular biology, pharmacology subjects like that. Um, okay, there's my personal email address. You can contact me about any of the Verev Med YouTubes that you see out there uh, on the internet. I've published about 30 of them now. And uh, also you can discuss with me specific and general topics of any of the things that uh, I have expertise in, which again, primarily I'm a lipid biochemist uh, with training in uh, biology, molecular biology, and molecular genetics. Uh, okay, so it's December. We're very close to Christmas now. We're only a little over a week away, so we're getting to the countdown. I wanted to get enough of these lectures in before Christmas actually arrived, and I'm going to be able to do that. Uh, one more thing before I um, get into the topic. This is my Facebook page. I don't think I've published this before, so if you want to take a look at where all of these Verif Med lectures are, just go to my Facebook page, and you're going to see where they're posted. I also have a Twitter feed that does the same thing. So let's just get started. So my discussion today is going to be in sphingolipids and biomedicine, research lecture video number three. All right. So in order for you to know something about sphingolipids, you have to know where they come from. And they come from all of the ingredients, all that is all the substrates for the biosynthesis of sphingolipids, with the uh, exception of the occasional polyunsaturated fatty acid of the omega-6 or omega-3 uh, series which may be um, bound to certain sphingolipid moieties, all of the major building blocks, just like we, uh, we will see with phospholipids, come from uh, synthesis that occurs um, non-essentially in the human. <coughs> that is, we make it without any requirement of nutrition. So let's get started and look at this metabolic pathway. The last couple of times I was introducing just fatty acid metabolism, and if you recall, the end product of fatty acid synthesis in the cytoplasm is palmitoyl, pal palmitic acid. Palmitic acid is esterified to coenzyme A, making this acyl-CoA intermediate called palmitoyl-CoA. That thioester allows that palmitate, that 16-carbon saturated fatty acid, to be further metabolized into multiple myriad pathways. This is one of those pathways. Palmitoyl-CoA can condense with L-serine, the amino acid serine, to make 3-ketosphinganine, the second molecule there. 3-ketosphinganine is going to be reduced ketone to the alcohol here, to sphinganine. That's the general base that you're going to see in all these lipids. Now, what I want you to get clear here is that these are membrane lipids and signaling lipids. They are not nutritional lipids, although they feed in and out of the nutritional bioenergetic pathways because of their utilization of fatty acids and also phosphonylcholine, which you find, of course, in phosphoglycerol lipid, phosphatidylcholine. But the point here is that this backbone that we're making, the sphingonine backbone we're making, replaces the glycerol backbone in normal phosphoglycerol lipids that you normally think about that are found in the membrane. Okay, so we made sphingonine. All we need to do now is add another fatty acid. This is going to be from the acyl-CoA pool, and we're going to make an amide linkage. So that's unique to this lipid class. You have an amide linkage here. 
There are some other subclasses of phosphoglycerol lipids that do have amide linkages, but this one is absolutely common and required for sphingolipids. You've now made dihydroceramide. All you need to do now is the all-important desaturation of this palmitic acid uh, to generate a double bond. Now, what's interesting about this double bond in ceramide, very important intermediate in sphingolipid metabolism, ceramide, is that you've got this uh, double bond, but it's in the trans configuration, the trans geometry. So I told you, I promised you that eventually I'm going to talk about how trans fatty acids, um, uh, uh, there's a bunch of hubris and hyperbole around trans fatty acids in the diet. Right here, right at the beginning, I want to show you, demonstrate to you that you have in your body a very important, absolutely required lipid that has a trans double bond in it. And that trans double bond is just as native and natural as a cis double bond. So there's nothing wrong with trans double bonds in nature. There's one right there and it's always in the ceramide molecule. It's always in that palmitate at those two carbon atoms. Okay, trans double bonds, stable and essential and necessary and universal for ceramide. Now ceramide, this, as I said, is a key intermediate in this biosynthetic pathway, can be used to make almost all the other complex sphingolipids. So it can make sphingomyelin, that's the sphingolipid that surrounds the myelin sheath and central nervous system nerve fibers. It could also make the glycosphingolipids, which are again found primarily in the central nervous system. And we'll talk about those in subsequent lectures when we get into specific papers. Uh, this copy can be broken down by ceraminidase. Ceraminidase just removes this amide linkage, and now you're just left here. Back, the only difference here, of course, is you've got the double bond, so now you don't have sphingenine, you have sphingosine. Now, sphingosine um, doesn't just get degraded further. It actually can be phosphorylated, making sphingosine 1-phosphate. It's phosphate added here. Now, that is a really important signaling molecule. So, there are going to be a lot of interesting things we're going to talk about, not today, but subsequently about ceramide and sphingosine 1-phosphate. And these lipids, again, these aren't used for energy. These aren't stored in the adipose tissue and called upon uh, during low levels of glucose uh, in the serum so that you beta oxidize them. No, not at all. These lipids are really important signaling autocoid hormones in basically all cells in the human body. So they're very interesting molecules. And... Um, you know, I can't just say more more about them, except that they're also, of course, again, the bedrock of sphingolipids in the membrane. And the membranes that are most um, entrusted with sphingolipids are those that are in the central nervous system and also in the peripheral nervous system. So some, just some brief overlay, so you get an idea of what kind of metabolic play we're talking about here. The conversion of sphingomyelin, which is one class of sphingolipid, into ceramide, so that one conversion is a one enzyme step, it's caused by sphingomyelinase. That plays, just that one reaction plays a really important role in membrane microdomain function, vesiculation as the production of vesicles, and all the fusion and fission and vesicular trafficking associated with many aspects of cellular signaling. So that one enzyme controls the flux through those pathways. Very, very essential, very important. And very interesting when you talk about the, the fluid dynamics of membranes in association with the molecular dynamics of trafficking and signaling. Okay, so that's why sphingolipids are so exciting to us lipid biochemists. So at the cell surface, for example, in the plasma membrane, you get a, a phenomenon known as receptor clustering. So, you know, if you think about a receptor and it binds to its ligand, right? Like let's say insulin receptor binds to its ligand, signals are transduced, there's a phosphorylation cascade that's induced and ultimately uh, glucose is taken up right by that cell and insulin dependent glucose uptake cells that are that are so endowed with that uh, GLUT4 system. Um, mm -hmm. What I want you to understand mm -hmm. is that indeed the, um, mm -hmm. the, the whole pathway itself uh, requires a clustering of those receptors. So you don't just have one receptor molecule, you have a clustering of them. And that clustering is actually afforded by having lipid rafts, which are endowed with certain sphingolipids. So the lipid rafts is a biophysical phenomenon of um, tearing away from things like Golgi apparatus or plasma membrane 
in so doing, carrying with them micro domains of proteins like receptors, clustering those receptors and thus enhancing signaling. So you get the idea of how lipids play a very dynamic role and the, and the lipid that we're talking about here that plays such a dynamic role uh, are the sphingolipids. Ceramide also itself, that Molokov just showed you, can affect the permeability of the mitochondrial outer membrane. And in fact, we know it does. And that in fact allows for the release of cytochrome C and that is regulatory for apoptosis, okay, which we've also talked about quite recently in these Varavmed lectures. And I want you to keep that in mind as well when we get into some of the more of the biochem uh, biomedical papers. So here's the pathway, uh, the pathway that's further elaborated. So sphingomyelin, a very important sphingolipid, okay? And I'll show you that structure and what it looks like subsequently. But that's a membrane lipid. Just imagine it's sitting in the membrane. Um, it can be metabolized via an enzyme known as sphingomyelinase. Now these red uh, uh, nomenclature here, these various red uh, words here uh, are actually drugs which block these enzymes. I'm not going to talk about these drugs. This came from a paper that was talking about some pharmacology of this pathway, but I will later. Okay, just so you have an idea that this entire pathway is very well interrogated by the research literature. At any rate, stringomyelin is broken down to ceramide. You know what that looks like? I, just, I showed you before. Now, ceramide's not through, okay? Ceramide can, can again be broken down to. Uh, um, down this pathway here to sphingosine, right? If sphingosine can be phosphorylated, as we saw, and that sphingosine 1-phosphate can actually uh, be broken down, this is actually a degradation pathway to nethylamine 1-phosphate and palmitylaldehyde. Now, you can also build up, as we have seen, um, from sphingosine 1-phosphate, okay, to sphingosine, okay, so we lose mm -hmm. the phosphate this way, and from sphingosine we can synthesize ceramide. So this is a salvage pathway using ceramide synthase. So you can go from the signaling molecule to back to the signaling molecule via that pathway, or as we've saw seen the de novo pathway, right, from serine and palmitoyl CoA, ultimately going uh, to ceramide, then ceramide down this pathway, sphingosine one phosphate. So you can see there's a lot of metabolic pathway uh, interaction here for sphingomyelin, ceramide, and the sphingosine 1-phosphate. Now, what I'm not showing you is even more complicated, which are all the glycer uh, glycerol uh, sphingolipids, and they're going to be involved also in this metabolic play. That's a really complex slide, but I want to go through it because it gives you um, the, the actual reality of how sphingolipids play such an essential role in the cell. So I like this slide uh, because it shows you some mm. of the uh, intramembranous regions. So here's the nucleus and the endoplasmic reticulum associated with the nucleus. Here's the Golgi apparatus, and the Golgi apparatus is feeding into the plasma membrane, okay? And this came from a paper in PLOS One in uh, spring of 2015, and there is actually the uh, link for it. So let's just go through this real quickly, and I'm going through it quickly because we're going to go through this slowly when we discuss Alzheimer's disease. In fact, this is an Alzheimer's disease paper. So you can see here, for example, Alzheimer's disease decrease in A-beta here, Alzheimer's disease decrease in endocytosis, Alzheimer's degree, disease decrease in autophagocytosis. This is all, this whole paper is geared to tell you how sphingolipid metabolism is altered in Alzheimer's disease in human patients. Okay, so you can see not just in healthy uh, biology, but in patho physiology, uh, these shrinkle lipids play a major role. So what's going on here? So the first thing that can happen is um, you can have a pro-acid, so there's acid and neutral sphingomyelinase, multiple isoforms mm -hmm. of that enzyme, and it can be distributed between the Golgi apparatus, uh, uh, which is a secretory pathway, and the lysosomal pathway. So the, the acid sphingomyelinase can follow along with exosomes, or it can stay within the cell and stay in the lysosome. Okay, so depending on the fate of that acid sphingomyelinase, you're going to be carrying out membrane lipid tailoring phenomenon that also is going to cause a mobilization of vesicular trafficking. Okay, so not just uh, a, a change in membrane, but entire change in the poise of that cell in terms of signaling and regulation of how it's going to be m modifying and mediating endo and excess so sphingomyelinase, ceraminidase, and phospholipases can all induce the formation of secretory vesicles. 
And they all are going to have different sphingolipid uh, composition. And when they package sphingolipid within the exosomes, they're also packaging the enzymes, which will allow for the metabolism of sphingolipids. Isn't that an interesting and clever way to transport out an entire manufacturing guild, sometimes through the plasma membrane and out into the extracellular space, in fact, even into the blood. Now, third thing that we can discuss, so that's all this process. Third thing is that as, um, sec secreted acid sphingomyelinase, now we're outside of the cell, okay, and this enzyme is essential for endocytosis and membrane repair and remodeling. So membranes get repaired and remodeled. Just like when we talked about uh, chromatin remodeling, membranes are very dynamic macromolecular structures that just have not really been accounted for at any significant level because we don't have a sequence of membranes like we have a sequence of DNA and RNA and a sequence for protein. We don't have a sequence for the macromolecule known as the membrane. Okay, we don't have the technique really to be able to do that uh, down to the fine grain. Soon, hopefully, we will be able to do that using combinations of things like LC mass spec, um, uh, and, and probably other, other uh, um, uh, more sophisticated uh, methods. At any rate, um, uh, using probably heavy isotopes. At any rate, that's, what, that's another processing, processing a retailering of membrane by the secreted acid sphingomyelinase. Um, moving on here, D here, okay. Uh, sphingomyelinases are involved in endocytosis, okay. Again, an acid sphingomyelin, not a neutral. And that influences, in this case, they were talking about the amyloid precursor protein, that's the APP, that's really important when you discuss Alzheimer's disease. And I don't worry, I will go through this in intimate detail in another paper when I'm only going to talk about sphingomyelin and sphingomyelin metabolism and Alzheimer's disease. But just right now, I'm just like introducing it. Um, and what that does is that processes this uh, um, this protein here, and that regulates the amount of A beta. Now, many of you probably know that the amount of A beta has been linked to the severity of Alzheimer's disease. So right away, you see the sphingolipids are gonna play a role in mobilizing, right? Mobilizing these proteins, these amyloid precursor proteins out of the plasma membrane and into the cell where they cannot be used to generate A beta, where A beta is the bad player, okay? So again, these enzymes play super important roles in pathologies. Um, next thing can happen here, uh, a the, going back into the cell, not the ones that left, but staying in the cell, the lysosomal acid sphingomyelinase is important for autophagocytosis. So we know autophagocytosis is part of the autophagy pathway during stress of the cell. So this whole system is, is being super in, impositionally regulated by the sphingomyelinase pathway. And that requires certain levels of sphingomyelin in these membranes and then the enzymes mm -hmm. involved in their metabolism. Um, so we can then uh, uh, culminate this rather complex slide by saying, dysfunction sphingolipid metabolism results in changes in membrane physical properties, as we're seeing here. An anomaly in exocytosis and endocytosis can occur, can occur because of changes in sphingomyelinase and sphingolipids. And therefore, you get defective trafficking of lipids and micro and, uh, and macro membrane domain anchored proteins in diseases like Alzheimer's and other neuropathologies. So just to give you like a little taste of how significant these lipids are. So real quickly here, let's talk about ceramide structure and metabolism. Again, sphingosine is the base for sphingolipids, okay? There it is. There's the palmitic acid moiety. There's the serine moiety. And there's that transient, there's that trans double bond, that trans double bond. And you compare that to glycerol, right? Remember, glycerol lipids are what you normally think of membrane lipids. A lot more simpler structure, right? Yeah. All right. Here is the actual uh, um, structure for N-acyl sphingosine, okay, or ceramide. So ceramide has this palmitic oil fun uh, functional group, the serine functional group, and the amide-linked fatty acid. And notice this fatty acid is very significantly a C22. Right? It's a C22 saturated fatty acid. Now that is what you find most often in ceramide. That fatty acid, that's not an essential fatty acid, that's not a polyunsaturated fatty acid either. So the way this works is you have dihydrosphingosine. You pick up this uh, C22 saturated fatty acid. It happens to be called behenic acid. Uh, and it's, of course, it's going to be esterified as a CoA. And there's your amide linkage. 
And then you have the hydroceramide, and that's when you're going to introduce that double bond. So not until you add that amide-linked fatty acid do you get that desaturation. It's very important in terms of a hierarchy of how you synthesize ceramide. Uh, here's sphingomyelin. Notice sphingomyelin has an amide linked fatty acid, but notice it's not the same fatty acid, right? Here it's a C18. So that lipid that's around the myelin sheath actually has another saturated fatty acid, but it's sterate, C18 colon O. Sterate is a very common, very, very common saturated fatty acid synthesized de novo in cells, okay, in human cells. No requirement for diet, right? It's a saturated fatty acid. That's what that is. The only difference between this and ceramide, notice, it has this phosphonylcholine residue. That is phosphonylcholine. Trimethylated, right? Trimethylated ethanolamine. Okay, trimethylated ethanolamine is phosphonylcholine, or that is choline with phosphate groups, phosphate ester. This phosphonylcholine actually came from phosphatidylcholine, right, in an exchange pathway. So sphingolipids, yes, indeed, the horror is here. Sphingolipids are intermediates in phospholipid metabolism and vice versa. Wow. All right, here it is. Ceramide reacting with phosphatidylcholine, just sitting there in the membrane, making sphingomyelin. Like, look, totally took that phosphatidylcholine, totally created an entirely different lipid in the membrane, right? And removed ceramide, which is a very important, uh, very potent signaling lipid, completely pulled that out of the cell and turns it into a membrane lipid. One fell swoop, right? Uh, and also makes diacyclycerol. So not only did you do that, you pull that out, you you got rid of the phosphatidylcholine was in the membranes. You're going to change membrane fluidity, and membrane dynamics. You also have made diacylglycerol. Diacylglycerol, if some of you may know, it turns on an entire protein kinase cascade system, protein kinase C pathway. So this so it changes one entire metabolic fate with another in one reaction, and in so doing it also changes the membrane. I mean, this is a lot of dynamics in the cell. So just to give you an idea. Uh, about how this is linked to apoptosis, because that's been a really uh, uh, important lecture topic uh, recently in Vera Med that I've been giving. Uh, a ligand, like a program death ligand, can die, bind to a de death receptor, like pro program death receptor, like on a T cell, for example, um, and turn on caspase, and caspase ultimately uh, turns on caspase 3, and that causes apoptosis. Um, it also, so also, this is associated with the synthesis of ceramide, Okay, and that ceramide is generated by sphingomyelinase, taking sphingomyelin from the mitochondria and generating ceramide. Ceramide, as we said, is involved in the outer membrane release of cytochrome C, and that's the mitochondrially associated um, apoptosis. So you see this is the mitochondrial fraction, and this is a direct fraction for apoptosis. Both linkages are associated with sphingolipids. So now you're just, we're adding more players to apoptosis. We're seeing that membrane lipids play an absolutely vital role here. Okay. So uh, just to keep things uh, interesting, um, the cytokine tumor necrosis factor alpha binds to its receptor. It turns on a sphingomyelinase at the membrane, making ceramide. Ceramide blocks all of this pathway here. This is all the pathway that leads to the inhibition of apoptosis. So ceramide's going to render that inert. But other, so instead of that, it's going to turn on caspase 3 and directly apoptosis, as we've been talking, right? It's going to do it its direct pathway there. It's also going to work through the mitochondria, as we said. It's going to help generate, actually, the apoptotic cell body or the apotosome, uh, turning on caspase 9, 6, and 7. This is like the reinforced heavy duty, bring in all of the army to cause the cell to die via programmed death, okay? So again, ceramide, key, poise there. All you have to do is break down sphingomyelin and you're on the road. You block the pathway that normally blocks apoptosis. And you that, it, that is, you block that and you induce the production of the mitochondrial associated program cell death, as well as a direct one. All from binding this tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is, of course, a pro-inflammatory cytokine, right? Uh, and this important protein here, factor associated with sphingomyelinase, that protein has to be there, the adapter protein. All right. 
Here's yet another whole system you can talk about. Uh, sphingosine can be broken down, as we said, to, uh, can be used, that is, from ceramide to make sphingosine 1-phosphate. Sphingosine 1-phosphate, now watch this. It's synthesized in the cell. It leaves the cell through its own uh, mediated uh, receptor. Sphingosine 1-phosphate is now extracellular. It's going airborne here. It's, out in, it's outside the cell. And it binds back to G-protein coupled receptors, which are specific for sphingosine 1-phosphate. This is obviously an autocoid pathway, right? And this turns on these a whole host of other enzymes, AKT, phospholipase C, Rho junk, and those have various cellular responses. So here you just have one lipid, right, sphingosine, which came from ceramide, you phosphorylate it. Now, you could degrade it. That's what that is, the degradation pathway. But you can also use it as the autocoid hormone, reinforcing the signal. So we saw uh, ceramide was involved in apoptosis. Sphingosine 1-phosphate tends to work contrary to that. Not quite contradictory, but contrary to ceramide metabolic consequence. All right. So... Again, we're taking a look at sphingosine versus ceramide. Sphingosine itself can be involved in apoptosis and cell cycle arrest. Ceramide, uh, as we've been saying, is directly involved in that. We make ceramide from sphingomyelin. We can also synthesize sphingomyelinite from ceramide. Here's the de novo pathway. We can also make a new one, a new player, ceramide 1-phosphate, and it's working for cell survival, cell proliferation, and pro-inflammation. Quite different from ceramide, see, which is involved in programmed cell death and even aging and senescence, okay, and cell cycle arrest. So just this one phosphorylation pathway, either via this kinase or then removing the phosphate back to ceramide, totally changes the dynamics of the cell, right? We know that ceramide is a precursor to sphingosine and vice versa. We saw that sphingosine could be used to make sphingosine 1-phosphate, and the sphingosine 1-phosphate is also working in contrary to ceramide. Cell motility, cell survival, uh, autophagy, cell proliferation, and further inflammation. Very, very important. Uh, and this is way back in 2005 when this paper was uh, published. So you can see we've been looking at this for a good 15, 20 years. Well, 10 to 15 years, I would say, yeah. Since 2000. Okay, so uh, just to finish up this, this is just a preliminary talk. There are, besides ceramide and sphingosine 1-phosphate, which I said are intermediaries in the full biosynthetic pathway, you have to make sphingolipids as well. So here's sphingomyelin. Remember that sphingomyelin is ceramide with a phosphonylcholine. Okay, and remember the fatty acid will be different between ceramide and sphingomyelin. So the major categories of cellular membrane sphingolipids are the sphingomyelins and the glycosphingolipids. That means they're just going to have a sugar moiety. Right? Sphingomyelins are the structural lipid of the of nerve cells, right? The myelin sheath, right? There it is. And then all the glycosphingolipids, which are built on a ceramide backbone, such as glucocerebroside and galactocerebroside and various combinations and nuances of all of these compounds, these are obviously, because they're called cerebrosides, super important in the central nervous system. And there are indeed a whole host of um, inborn errors of metabolism that relate to the lack of turnover of uh, glucocerebrosides and galactocerebrosides. So once again, here's a glucocerebroside or sphingomyelin. The only difference here is you've got the sugar moiety, right? Just showing the structure. Here is the store. Here are the storage diseases. Just a small sampling of storage diseases, in, inborn errors of metabolism that are linked to alter that are be, because of, shall we say, or at least highly correlated with sphingolipid dysfunction. Tay Sachs, Gauchev's, uh, Krebs disease, Neiman Pick. Okay, these are all really bore, uh, uh, bad diseases. These can be inborn errors of metabolism. Uh, Tay Sachs blindness, muscle weakness. Gauchev's, I covered in a previous. Um, Verabed lecture, liver and spleen enlargement, uh, and uh, 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 crab disease, demyelination, uh, sphingolipids that are involved, gangliosides, glucocerebrosides, galactocerebrosides, sphingomyelin for Neiman Pick. This also is linked to a cholesterol, uh, a nick in the cholesterol pathway. The enzymes involved, which have mutations and therefore are related directly to these diseases, are beta hexosaminidase A, beta glucosidase. Beta galactosides, you see these are all degradation pathways. So if you don't turn over the glycosyl uh, sphingolipids, that's what causes the disease. Okay. 
All right. So I'm not going to go through all of these because uh, this is an entire biomedical discussion, but I just want you to see that all these diseases here, right? Many of the ones that you have, not, have heard of and some that you haven't, like the Santoff or the Santoff tay sachs variant, are all because of perturbations, dysfunctions, and, and enzymes involved in glucosyl cerebricide metabolism. That's what all these GAs and GMs are here. So you get an idea about all the different complex diseases that are linked just to the inability to turn over the glycosyl um, uh, sphingolipids. So that's a whole other discussion. Been in the literature a very long time. It wasn't until more recently that we've determined all the individual variants of these diseases, because there are several variants, um, and what the real causal mechanisms are. It all involves the turnover of these really important bioactive membrane lipids. All right. Finally, I just want to remind you again how this is fed back into the pathway. Here are, uh, these are called gangliosides, by the way. So you have gangliosides, cerebrosides, and sulfatides. It's sulfatide just, it's a glycosyl sphingolipid that has a sulfate. Uh, gangliosides just has a more complex carbohydrate uh, ornamentation, okay? And cerebroside, again, directly, that's just glucose. Uh, all of these can feed into production of ceramide. You know, it's a really important biologically active molecule. You know that sphingomyelin can feed into it, and you know that ultimately can be finely degraded all the way back down to that palmitol aldehyde uh, and ethanolamine 1-phosphate. All right. So we're going to stop there. I just wanted to give you that brief overview of what I think are really some of the most um, under-recognized uh, and undeservedly so of the membrane lipids, which again impart a tremendous dynamics to um, the human uh, metabolic interactive play that's involved in stress phenomena, that's involved in healthy turnover of lipids and signaling, as we saw, uh, which control cell fate, and which also obviously are uh, intensely linked with various kinds of disease states. Um, and so those disease states then are something that I'm going to try to talk about um, in subsequent lectures, because I know a lot of you are really interested in that. And what we're going to do is we're going to take our now new knowledge on sphingolipids, and we're going to use that knowledge and drive it through to discuss what's in the literature uh, specifically about how sphingolipids and sphingolipid metabolism go south and in so doing uh, is correlated with uh, and is related to various disease states. A lot of neuropathologies, but also a lot of motor pathologies uh, and a whole host of intermediary metabolism uh, dysfunctions. So thanks a lot for your attention and I hope you have a very pleasant Christmas. Um, I think I'm going to give one more lecture before then, so you'll see me one more time before then. Um, and so uh, my normal sign-off, which is uh, what I've been doing for quite a while now, is I want to say goodbye for now.